Greetings! My name is Luke Tomlinson, and I'll be teaching you about a culture technique that's gained a lot of popularity in neurobiology in the last 20 years. The title of my talk is Microflow, Microfluidic Devices in Neurobiology. The purpose of this video is to teach you about microfluidic devices and how they've been used in neurobiology. By the end of this video, you'll be familiar with what a microfluidic device is, how it works, and how scientists have used it recently. Let's go to some background first. When culturing neurons, previous methods were limited in their ability to control precisely where neurons grow. For example, examine a single neuron with just three branching axons. If a researcher wants to test how one manipulation changes the function of that neuron and observe the downstream effects, that's a relatively simple experiment. But what happens when you do the same thing with a cluster of neurons that are growing indiscriminately overlapping with one another? There's no easy method to precisely change a single axon and then observing the effects from that change. Because you might be also influencing the surrounding cells and tissues. And that's where microfluidic devices come in. We are familiar with traditional petri dish type in vitro approaches, where cells grow on a flat 2D surface. But what happens when you have guided grooves and channels for the cells to grow in? That's the main benefit of microfluidic devices. They better help mimic human biology by allowing more precise control of the environment that the neurons grow in. And what makes these devices special primarily lies in the geometry the micrometer-sized shapes, grooves, and pillars. So here's one example of an electron mi microscope image of a microfluidic device. And here, you see a schematic of a culture chamber with the important microfluidic features in the center component that connects the yellow and black sides. This setup was made from a mold with micrometer-sized channels, with the end product being made out of silicone and coated with something biological to help cell adhesion and survival. So how do these miniature structures help neuronal growth? The key is not so much about increasing cell viability or promoting growth, but this technique better allows manipulations of single cells and axons based on their spatial location. This type of microfluidic-based culture is great for directing axonal growth and isolating axons from each other. Here, it's clear that single axons are able to extend from one side of the chamber to the other without overlapping or going outside of the bounds of those micro-sized channels. But why is creating these channels worth the effort? More than other cell types, neurons are very sensitive to environmental cues, whether that's substrate roughness, temperature, the culture medium, pH values, calcium and iron concentrations, all of these things researchers want to be able to control when doing their experiments. The microfluidic culture platform provides a new method to direct, isolate, lesion, and biochemically analyze axons. Because microfluidics allow easy axon isolation, axon injury and regeneration studies are easier to control. In this study, axons were allowed to grow in a microfluidic device. After developing, a laser was used to sever a single axon while the rest of the neuron and axons were monitored. To the right, you see the progressive healing over five hours. Because of the precise control, researchers could better investigate the mechanism of nerve healing. This is the type of science that hopefully precedes therapeutics to heal nerve damage. However, microfluidics is not limited to simply isolating strands of axons and making observations on that but also for complex neural circuitry and signaling. A big part of neurobiology is not just studying brain tissue, but nervous systems and its connectivity to other organ systems within the body. This schematic shows one creative way researchers used microfluidics to investigate neural signaling from neurons to other cell types, ranging from stem cells, muscle cells, cancer cells, glial cells, and also bone cells. The point here is that there are many possibilities to better understand neurobiology and neural signaling with this type of approach using microfluidics. Microfluidics are not limited to very simple study designs, though that is one great benefit. Here 
we see the several different options that researchers have when using a microfluidic device setup. They can separate the cell body portion of a neuron from the axon and dendrites, and then test to see different manipulations on different parts, and then the resulting changes in the other parts of the neuron. Whether that's introducing toxins, a different drug, dissociating the neurons, physical changes, severing the axons, really anything. But the possibilities are really endless for this. Anyways, I hope you learned something about microfluidic devices. Thank you for watching.